herzlich willkommen zu Unzensiert, der Gesprächsreihe beim Filmfest Hamburg mit freundlicher Unterstützung der Zeitstiftung. Ich freue mich sehr, dass heute die pakistanische Filmemacherin Sabia Sumar bei mir zu Gast sein wird und wir werden uns auf Englisch unterhalten. Welcome, great to have you here. Thank you. Um, your documentary, As Maish, A Journey Through the Subcontinent, um, is literally a journey of you and uh, a friend of yours. Uh, she's a and Bollywood actress from mm -hmm. India. You're from Pakistan. Two women tra traveling through both of the countries. Um, how did you develop this idea? Um, I think it's very difficult to separate um, India and Pakistan because they're really cut from the same cloth. And to understand one country, it's also important to look at what's happening in the other country. Um, I felt it was very ironic that Pakistan started as an Islamic state, and India started as a secular state. And then we come to this point where India is wanting to look at creating a Hindu identity for itself, while Pakistan is challenged by the Islamists, the Taliban, and wants to actually get away from its Islamic identity and sort of looking towards a secular outlook. So. I was thinking 70 years after partition, when the two countries were separated, you have a situation where they're coming together in different ways. Why is India looking for an, a Hindu identity? What's is happening there? And why is Pakistan wanting to get away from its Islamic identity? So that for me is what spurred the film on. I thought it was very interesting that you not only showed all the problems that are happening, but also your personal journey as well. Um, like the questions you just asked, um, you actually ask in the movie as well, and um, the friend you're traveling with uh, too. But um, it wasn't, I wondered, uh, I mean, it's a special choice to, to, um, to make this movie with the Bollywood actress. I mean, this is a statement as well. So wh why was it her? Well, I think Kalki is more than a Bollywood actress because when I met her, she and I really connected on the questions that we wanted to explore. And she had seen my previous work, um, a documentary I did called Dinner with the President, um, which was kind of similar in its journey approach to asking the question of how will democracy come to Pakistan? And what does democracy mean to the people of Pakistan? So um, having seen that, she felt that she too wanted to explore questions about India. And I very much wanted not somebody with a journalistic approach, not a very hard-nosed approach, but a more personal approach, because it affects our lives. It affects the way we live, the way we can think about uh, what we can do and what we can't do. I mean, suddenly, when our countries are going through such enormous changes, we find ourselves censoring our thoughts, censoring our, um, our way of being. And um, like, oh, I cannot say this in public because it could get me into trouble. Mm -hmm. Or um, Pakistan has now changed so much that I have to be cautious about what I can express and what I can't, or India is not really uh, open-minded about certain ways, you know? So I think that it affects our lives, and that's what really made us feel that we want to explore this, what's going on, how is it affecting us, and I want to share it with a lot of people. You have been to India many times. I think Kaki, for her, it was the first journey to Pakistan Yes. Ever. So what was her feeling about this, how she experienced this journey? I think it was exhilarating for her on the one hand because there's so much talk about Pakistan in India. You know, it's uh, quite obsessive. Um, and then Indians don't find it easy to travel to Pakistan. So it was very exhilarating. And at the same time, she was able to think about her old prejudices about Pakistani people, because the media is always putting out images about Pakistan as being extremely religious, extremely violent, extremely um, hostile, and so on. 
and we found so many friendly people and we found so many people we could connect with and I think this is a power of films that it allows you to connect with people you think are very different from you you find a connection that is just human on an emotional level connection at the level of loss or happiness or um, what we need in our lives and I think it was the same for Kalki um, of course one can talk about the differences between India and Pakistan at the theoretical level but at the human level they're really all the same isn't it I mean people in India are also not able to live their lives well there there is the question of poverty which is really great in both countries we'll come back to that in, in a minute but uh, I wondered what did you discover through Kalki then in India I mean was there anything new you learned because you traveled with her? Yes. I think the way people opened up to her was different than what I would have gotten in terms of responses. People were open um, to her not because she's in Indian, but also because she's a Bollywood actress and they wanted to talk to her. They wanted to give her something of themselves and that was quite nice. Um, for me, that was a gift, really, to be able to travel with her and see it from her perspective also, the kinds of questions she raised with people. I would have been a bit cautious because I'm not from that culture, and um, I would have felt, am I being offensive? Should I really ask this? Uh, am I allowed to ask that? So it was good to have a certain freedom in the way she traveled. You're on screen as well, and um, for me, it, it, you had a very special way of talking to people. You were so calm and very honest and somehow, yeah, sincere, but still you didn't let go, you know, if somebody <laughs> didn't want to answer you. Um, is this something you trained, or is it just uh, kind of your personality? I don't know, I think that um, these questions are personally very important to me and I do want answers for them and I will not let go until I have those answers because it's about my life also. So I think there is um, perhaps a kind of stubbornness about not wanting to let go because if I don't get it here, I must get it somewhere else or somewhere else, um, how can how can I be denied the information that I seek or not always information but it's points of views and um, a sharing of life and I feel through my films I'm sharing my life with people I'm always open to answering their questions about who I am what I do why I do it or anything else that they may want to ask I always uh, want to have it like a conversation you know and um, because I am troubled to see um, such desperate lives around me. And, uh, and it troubles me that um, very few people control the way we live our lives. So I, I insist that I get the answers somehow. Kind of right in the beginning, you, you say that you are scared as well. You're scared of all these eyes, of all these men who who have a certain violence in them and, and, who, you, and who have needs too. And um, this is kind of a motive that goes through that whole movie um, where there are actually moments while filming where you had a good reason to be scared. I mean, like dangerous moments. Were they dangerous moments? But I want to, sorry, but I want to go back to your question. I wasn't scared of the men because I felt that they were violent. That was not it. I was scared because I knew what they needed in life, a direction, mm -hmm. um, a purpose that was positive. And I knew that they had great potential for harming themselves and harming others. Because if you're so desperate, you can be prey to anything. And it was this desperation that was scary. Mm -hmm. So, um, and what was also scary was that I knew that there is nobody to give this direction that is needed in the country. So, 
it wasn't really a f like I'm scared of them. No, I'm I didn't not. Have that fear, yeah. I'm not, but I'm scared of what what they are capable of doing. When you push people against the wall like that, you create violence in society. And I became aware of it through them, through their gaze, through their look onto me. I suddenly realized that we are up against a tremendous threat, a tremendous threat. And who is really answering this threat? Who's really looking at it? You know, this is what really troubled me. That's another part of the movie where you say all the roots of terrorism and very extreme leaders and thoughts is in, in people being poor and having no opportunity in, in life. And you talk to a lot of religious leaders as well to, to ordinary people on this journey and um, somehow show a very broad picture um, of all the problems there. there. And, and one part was that you said why there's even time for terrorism when people need food. Right, yes. I think that is something that comes across really strongly when you travel. And if you really, you know, just read the newspaper and foreign news and so on, you would think that the whole country is full of violent suicide um, warriors, you know. But really, I think there is a very basic human need that is not being answered. And then if you don't answer that need, you can have a lot of trouble. You can, you can really push people against the wall who will, for, you know, 3,000 euros, be ready to kill. Because what hope do they have in life? And to me, that's a very simple question. If you don't give hope to people, they have nothing to look forward to, then they can, they can kill. Because then they assure that that 3,000 euros would be something for their children or their families, mm. and never mind themselves. But you see, when they're living lives where they can't even afford one meal a day, and they're really on, on the streets, what can be expected of them? So we are creating this violence in our own societies. You know, we are creating the poverty. And then we are saying, oh, there's violence. So to me, it's very illogical. But of course, I also understand that it's a game of power, you know. Yeah. And what real possibilities do you see for a change in Pakistan? At the moment, uh, there is a real threat uh, to the ruling elite in Pakistan from the Taliban because they are very strong, they are armed, um, they have a vision, and uh, they are very self-righteous. And the Pakistan ruling elite is threatened by the fact that these people can actually take over or have the potential. And they also have the potential to take people on their side because they say, look, you've not gained anything from these rulers. Mm -hmm. Where are you? You don't even get two meals a day. So the rank and file, the, you know, the masses on the ground will go with the Taliban very easily because what do they have to lose? There's nothing. nothing. There's nothing to lose. And I think that realization is slowly happening in the minds of our leaders. So maybe there's hope for change there. You know? I think. I think it was astonishing that you talked to, I mean, to actual, you know, religious leaders as well as fertile landlords. Um, was it difficult to convince them to talk to you? Didn't seem easy. <laughs> um, I mean, it was very hard to get access and get intimate access of the kind I wanted. Most uh, people are used to sort of answering the request of a journalist to say, 
can I come and do an interview with you, you know? But both the people I interviewed, the feudal landlord as well as the religious leader, were very camera shy, very private people. And on top of that, I didn't want just one afternoon with them, uh, a couple of hours to sit down and have a chat. I really wanted to be with them for some time. But it was through very good friends that I found this access and you know I'm really grateful that they opened their homes to me and uh, hosted me. Um, it was difficult to to do the film the way I wanted to do it. I mean, in the sense that I wanted to be able to really get um, to see how they function, you know? What is their life like? Mm -hmm. um, what do they really think? What makes them do what they do? So it was much more than just having a question-answer session, you see? Yeah, it was um, very intimate. Almost. Yeah, I really wanted that. That was very necessary for me. Um, because I also want to see the human side to everything, and there is a reason why they're doing it. That's their understanding of the world. You know? So you also can't put a finger on them and say they're wrong. They're also a product of their own environment. In, to come back to my question, if you at, at one point were scared in, for sure, I mean, in a very dangerous situation, um, near the end you, you visit this little village on the countryside where they tell you to, to go, to leave. And, um, you know, I've, for me to see it was like, oh, oh my God, hopefully nothing happens to her. And, and yeah, was it really dangerous? Can you tell me anything about that on the other side? I mean, you had these political leaders in the big houses and, you know, yeah. and, and, and then the poor people on the countryside who are probably not used to cameras being around and right. the women coming there, traveling, I mean. Well, um, I mean, that, I, that was a bit of a shock for me, the way I reacted to that situation because I really felt very angered um, by the way they were treating the woman and the way they told her to go inside and shut the door and not talk to us. Um, but it wasn't, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't think that they would have harmed me. Um, I didn't feel a physical danger, but I felt, uh, I felt that they were closing the door on me, you know, and of course they were. Um, I think if I had been without a camera, all alone, I don't know, I, I can't say what would happen, you know. Um, maybe I if I had persisted, it would have become more ugly. Um, it's hard to say in moments like that, but there is certainly a potential um, that people lose their temper when they're confronted with a situation in which somebody is questioning their decisions, you know? And they do feel completely that they own the, the life of a woman, all the women, you see? They're women. So there is this sense of ownership, which is very strong. And who am I to interfere in that? You know? Um, and it, it, it feels to them, and I guess it is, a violation of what they perceive to be their rights. Because the thing in Pakistan is that there is no sense of individual rights. So there is no sense that a woman has her rights, a child has his rights, a man has his rights. Family. It's the family that has rights. And the family patriarch will decide what is good for the women and the children. They will not decide for themselves. They will not have the right to speak back to an elder and say, no, I want this or I would like to do that. That will 
that is never allowed, especially in the rural areas. Hmm? So with that kind of a mindset, it's really, um, I did take on a lot, but um, I also had to do that because it's my right to push it also. I mean, it's my country too, and I also want it to be a certain way. Yeah. I also want to live in a certain way. And while I understand that they have their rights and they want to do things a certain way, I don't interfere with that if they don't interfere with mine, you know? So it's, it's really what Kalki was talking about in the film, that the Hindu extremists can do what they want to do, I mean, in a democratic setup, we would have to tolerate all kinds of people, and that's fine. But why do they have the right to tell me how I should live my life? There was another part about, you know, the Hindu fundamentalists hating um, everything about the Islamic fundamentalists that is exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. So I thought, you know, it's a very universal message, I think, in the end. Right, I think it is, and it's very uh, strange. But in a film, you can see that very easily, which is what I really love about filmmaking, that you can show a mirror, you know, you can really show that the argument is same. And if you take the same argument and put it in Europe, in the United States, wherever, it will make sense, because these arguments are not just in the context of Pakistan and India alone. I think there's growing intolerance in our world today. You yourself, you started your career as a filmmaker back in the 80s. Um, yes. Um, in a country where it, there's not a big film business at all and uh, as a woman. So um, how was your journey <laughs> till this point now? I mean, you're very successful. I think your first uh, uh, long feature got like 17 prizes all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, you produced an Oscar-winning uh, short documentary. Um, you have your own production company doing all these um, very intense films about social topics. So I can quite imagine that you, yeah, you, you took on a long journey as well. Yeah, um, I mean, when I started out as a filmmaker, I think it was really hard because at that time, at exactly at that time, the little uh, industry we had was shutting down. It was already small, but it was, it was really all, all support was pulled back and censorship became really hard. Um, and at that time, when I remember when I told my parents that I wanted to study films and they were like, what, <laughs> you know? Um, but because really we couldn't see how it would happen, you know, and where would I find support within the country. But I was very lucky with my first film. Um, I got support uh, from a British uh, company, a producer, and then it, it sold to Channel 4. It was a film about women in prison under Islamic laws, and it did very well. So I think that is how things got started, but it has been difficult all along. I mean, every film is a huge and uphill task. It just doesn't become easy. And I don't understand. I mean, I thought that, you know, at some point I would have the feeling of, ah, I've arrived, you know. Um, but it just doesn't happen. What, what are the main problems you're facing? Is it people saying you, you're not allowed to talk about this? Is it uh, No, I think I've been quite, uh, quite obtuse to that kind of, uh, you know, comments, you can't do this or you can't talk about that. I just don't think about it. I just, I'm like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's not that. I think it's financing. It's financing. Films is just very expensive business. And it's uh, very hard to find financial support. The actual movie, um, As My Issue, Founded through crowdfunding, um, a part of it. I mean, post production. Yes. So, who who gave money to it? Was it mainly Indian or Pakistan people? 
Um, well, crowdfunding, crowdfunding was a small part of uh, this film, but it was really a very good process because through that, I really learned the interest that ordinary people had in this subject, you know? And really, the support was kind of equal. Oh, that's between, great. Yeah, that was really very, very good. Um, and, you know, my company put in a lot of money and we uh, borrowed and deferred and, you know, uh, we, uh, it was very difficult, very difficult. I have uh, one more thing I'd love to uh, read out loud. You said, Asmaish will help us to ask ourselves what society we want to live in and what kind of freedom do we want. So what you found during that process, uh, your goals are? Um, well, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm really trying to um, raise the question about what what does democracy mean in our world today? And I think until now, or recently, we've really seen that as a system which gives us freedom. And But we can see in India and Pakistan that it can also invert freedom, that it can really be an ideology that legitimizes through um, through majority rule a kind of oppression you know yeah. on the people and it can also be seen in um, in the US it can be seen in other parts of Europe as well so I really wanted to question this big idea of what is democracy and how do we understand it today and what do we need to do to be in a truly democratic world you know a world in which everybody is equal that we have equal rights that is not just about majority rule it's about human rights of all people for example during times of war i always find that even human rights organizations find it really hard to defend the rights of what they call terrorists but terrorists also have human rights, you yeah. see? So these questions are very troubling to me, and uh, I always want to bring it uh, out in the open for people to think about and question and really change their minds about how they understand terrorism, how they understand democracy, how they understand freedom, how they understand equality or inequality. I think your film is a big step um, towards that, and um, I'm very happy you made it. I'm very happy you took the time to be with us tonight, so thanks Thank a you. lot. Thank you.